All right. Well, uh, welcome all of you to uh, today's presentation. I'm going to share the screen now. Uh, so the title of this talk is Bridging Individual and Group Level Research to Understand the World System. Uh, we're joined here by Dr. Kareem Batash. Uh, just a few housekeeping uh, points to discuss before we start. Uh, so we're, we'll mute all participants uh, as soon as they enter. Um, you're encouraged to turn on your video camera if you'd like. Uh, during the talk, feel free to enter in any questions you might have into the chat room, and then during the Q&A, we'll uh, get to all of the, the questions from the chat room. Also, feel free to use the uh, raise hand function if you'd like to ask a question over the, the video feed or just over audio. And uh, let me just briefly uh, introduce Dr. Patash. He's currently a lecturer at Monash University, but he acquired his PhD in social psychology from the Chinese University here, uh, and his BS and MS in psychology at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Uh, so he's been interested throughout his career on social psychological processes relating to intergroup relations, cross-cultural uh, phenomena, and he spent several years here in Hong Kong. He worked as a lecturer for the Education University of Hong Kong, uh, a managing editor for the Asian Journal of Social Psychology, and he did a postdoctoral fellowship at CU as well. Uh, he's also the holder of the Distinguished Teaching Award from CUHK. Uh, so I will uh, skip past the abstract because we'll be uh, hearing directly from Dr. Dr. Batash. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to him. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Peter. That was uh, very nice. Um, let me let me first share my screen. Let's see if everything goes fine. So, do you guys see my screen now, full screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, yes. Good. All right. Um, well, uh, welcome to uh, to my uh, my seminar. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad. Uh, to be back in uh, in Hong Kong, so to speak, uh, or I should say, uh, semi back in Hong Kong uh, through uh, through internet. Um, I, I usually really love to do face to face seminars, um, but as I'm usually a, quite an ex expressive speaker and I like to use my hands and arms and, and wave, and so I, I really like face to face lectures. But unfortunately, uh, the pandemic has brought us in an uh, unusual situation, so we have to adapt to this way of communicating. Um, so, so before I start, I actually, uh, I, I was actually just right before the, 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 the presentation, I was thinking about, uh, uh, about the news that I read this morning uh, about the, the, the national uh, protests spreading across the United States in relation to the police killing of a, a, a black man and, and the interesting fact that the protests are actually spreading to the rest of the world. You see the protests in my country, the Netherlands, and you also even see uh, protest supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement, even in Hong Kong. So I realized how much that is relevant to the talk I'm doing today. It seems that people have reached a boiling point uh, in the United States, at least, of systemic racism, things that have always been treated as something that was uh, rooted in, in more individualist reasons, such as that's a bad apple, that's a bad police officer, or when, when, when black people would be in, in coffee shops and a white woman would call to say, hey, there's a suspect a, uh, a guy that is uh, that is uh, that I don't trust um, or, or when black people would barbecue in a, in, a, in a park and police would be called on them this was always related to individual cases of racism but it becomes more and more clear that we have a systemic global problem and that is something that we have to uh, focus on so I thought it's very 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 relevant uh, to, to the talk that I'm going today I always do a quick introduction for those who do not know me. I've seen some familiar faces. Um, so I'll do it quickly. Some of the things have already been said by Peter. So I'm Karim Betash, originally from a tiny country in the north of the uh, Europe called the Netherlands. Uh, I did my bachelor and master indeed in my own country. I worked uh, as a PhD student at CUHK under the supervision of Professor Fanny Jung. And uh, later on, I work as a postdoctoral fellow under the supervision of Professor Ju. Uh, currently, I'm working as a lecturer at Monash University. So what started out as an interest in psychology 
over the years after my graduation turned into an interest in the social sciences in general. In particular, working across multiple cultures in the world, I noticed an interesting phenomenon. I noticed that regardless of the cultures I was living in, many of the inequality enhancing tendencies of human beings are highly similar. That is, many of the problems such as discrimination, racism, poverty, follow highly similar patterns across cultures. So you can then do two things. You can say, A, that these are essential human characteristics or natural phenomena because universality proves that. Or B, you can say that the behavioral outcomes are not natural, but there are environmental contextual similarities across cultures that induce these similarities. I am more of the second school of thought. Let's take racism as an example. I do not believe that people are inherently racist or that people value light-skinned people more than dark-skinned people when they get born. Even though we see it across the world, I believe there is a global social system behind it that has influenced most, if not all, cultures around the world. I always use this example. A newborn baby is neither born capitalist nor racist. Okay? You can show a baby a pack of dollars and the baby will not go nuts and think, okay, I need that money. Similarly, you can show a baby a human being from any part of the world and the baby will not feel more negative to one of them based on the way he or she looks. These systems were human creations because they were once useful. It does not mean that they are good. It means that they at least were once useful to some groups of human beings. I noticed that mainstream psychological science had very interesting methods to study human, human behavior that can shed light on many human phenomena, but it did not seem to be tied to larger global contexts. So while psychology explains many human tendencies on an individual level, for example, racism, it often does not explain why these tendencies are so similar around the world and therefore neglects the necessity to find similarities in social historical trajectories across cultures to find out where these comparable tendencies come from. So I automatically started to read words from other social sciences to try and find an explanation for the observation that much of this inequality enhancing behavior around the world is similar and therefore must be rooted in comparable trajectories of such cultures. In particular, sciences with a reflective approach instead of only a positivist empirical approach caught my interest. In psychology, we have the tendency to focus mainly on systematic empirical research, which can explain phenomena at its most basic level, but without a reflective approach, we cannot position them into the wider global context. Similar ideologies, such as colorism, the idea that there is social hierarchy in a neutral biological phenomenon, such as skin color, or the belief in free market capitalism, are situated in an international realm of human beings and their relationships to one another, and therefore should be investigated as such. So I started to focus on social sciences to try to explain larger group level contextual factors beyond the individual psychological level, which quickly brought me to the political sciences and sociology. Last year, I was invited at the London School of Economics to give a talk about my work that I did with Professor Jew about the social psychology of neoliberalism. And it was at the London School of Economics that one of the professors asked me why I was not part of an IR department, as my work would neatly fit the individual aspects at the root of international relations. And I agree with him. I feel that psychology can benefit from the macro level focus of the political sciences. And in turn, the political sciences can benefit from the psychological level focus to explain similar constructs. So today, as time constraints do not allow me to go into everything too deep, and honesty compels me to say that I am someone who has the tendency to talk too long and too much and too passionately, about topics that I find interesting, I will suggest a relationship 
or maybe even a marriage, so to speak, between social psychology and IR to try and explain international dynamics in the world system from a multi-level approach. I will do so by revolving the examples around one event that has impacted social life globally in some way, shape or form. I will use the war on terror as an example about how both psychology and IR can join hands to explain such events. So probably we all remember the moment George Bush declared the war on terror when the Twin Towers of New York had been attacked in a 9-11 event. Bush declared an all-out war against terrorists and their supporters, but he went a step further. He stated that everyone who was not with the US would be against the US. Many social science constructs would be able to provide a clear depiction of why psychology and IR are inherently related. But for simplicity, I will attempt to give evidence for this through, through, through two approaches. By explaining the war on terror through the lens of human motivations, such as security values or identity, as well as explaining it through a lens of macro social political ideologies. Scholars with a Western centric view would discuss the war on terror from a security standpoint, where terrorists due to the 9-11 attacks are considered the aggressors and the United States as a state under security threat. One narrative argues that states have a right to fight preventive wars against those who, who could pose a mortal threat to them if they are allowed to build up their military power unchecked a claim forcefully made by the George Washington or George Bush administration after the 9-11 attacks. Realists in IR, for example, could argue that the attacks are a threat to US interests and hegemony. And once this happens, many realists would argue that the hegemonic state will do everything in its power to protect its interests. In this case, mobilizing the country to engage in war. There are many psychological assumptions in this position but let's highlight one of them. That under threat, societies will and are willing to mobilize to engage in in-group protective wars. In other words, to do so under threat, governments must have some form of legitimacy from the people to mobilize fellow citizens into warfare against the backdrop of George Bush's war on terror and Donald Trump's war on immigrants, I attempted to experimentally test this among Americans. During my postdoctoral years, I created an animated video. As you can see on the picture, you see two groups of humanoid characters. This was done on purpose to keep the study highly decontextualized to be able to generalize possible findings as universal. This is typical in psychology and one of the reasons why it is so important to tie such studies into global IR. The left group, Group number one is considered the tight group. So please remember this was a video. All characters move in exactly a similar fashion. Group two, the loose group. In this group, all characters behave randomly. Before presenting the video, I had American participants divided into three conditions. In the neutral conditions, they were asked to write down neutral sentences. In the social threat condition, they were asked to write down eight sentences, each in which they were a victim of a socially threatening event, such as bullying. And in the physical threat condition, in which they were victims of a physically threatening event, such as a natural disaster or war. So in psychology, we call it cognitive priming. We prime the avail avail availability of threat. After this, I presented them with the video and asked which group the American participants preferred. What happened was the following. Only in the physically threatening condition, more than half of the participants preferred the tight group, okay, the group where everyone is uniform. That is, Americans who are known to be highly individualist, who value uniqueness, started to prefer being part of a homogenous group. So they preferred being an amorphous entity in a uniform group. This effect was mediated by devaluation of individualist values, values of autonomy. So claims made in the social sciences that under threat, people will relinquish their autonomy and freedom in favor of group harmony and mobilization, 
now found some form of empirical psychological evidence. Here you can see the intricate connection between global context and individual psychology. So what you often see, not always, but often, is that both fields make assumptions. Psychology often assume, assumes a certain context as given, that is a threatening context, without asking why specific contexts are considered threatening and how they come about. Similarly, IR often assumes psychological motivations, such as a need for security, as a given without testing this psychologically. So as you may all know, the war on terror induced protest movements across the world. In many different countries, such as Italy and France, but also the US, people started protesting against the war. Here you have people in privileged societies, so to speak, who engage in collective action in favor of the underprivileged, people in poor country that get invaded, attacked. So why do these pro protest movements start? Where do these come from? While realist theories in IR mainly focus on the state and international level, they may have a harder time explaining these internal dynamics that interact with global development such as war. Assuming states as rational actors in their own self-interest ignores the human psychology behind it, behind it that either strengthens or attenuates these tendencies of states. But I am aware, even as a psychologist, that IR is a very diverse field. And indeed, many approaches do pay attention to this human aspect. Partly motivated, for example, by the need to explain the anti-Cold War movement, a track in IR called constructivism, realized that there is more at play than simply state-level cost-benefit analysis in international relations. And issues such as values, norms, and identity should come into play, play when explaining such developments. Again, here psychology could play an interesting role. Why do advantaged people engage in collective action for the disadvantaged? I studied this with Dutch and British psychologists in both the Netherlands and Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, we tested why Hong Kong Chinese individuals would stand up for discriminated minorities while they are not, not the target themselves. We tested what we call the social identity model of collective action. This was an experiment where people were either confronted with a neutral story or a story depicting a situation in Hong Kong where a minority person was mistreated. And the outcome was that people, Hong Kong people who identify with the larger group of human beings, that is also outgroup members, hold moral beliefs regarding e equality and therefore feel group-based anger, feel anger because of the suffering of other people. These factors taken together predict why you, as a Hong Konger, would jeopardize your comfort to stand up for people who are marginalized in society. So while psychology treats this decontextualized in, for example, in-group versus out-group terms, IR would study the developments from a contextual lens, often omitting the micro lens of psychology. The issue becomes even more pressing when we aim both our macro and micro lens to social political ideologies that impact not only international relations, but human psychology all across the globe. Let us take neoliberalism as an example an ideology that has acquired global reign in a capitalist world. Now, I am aware that this is a very, very complex issue, and there is a lot of agreement and disagreement, and of which I cannot even scratch the surface uh, during a short seminar such as this one. But even a short discussion may prove its worthiness. I have recently edited with Professor Chu a special issue in the Journal of Social Issues about the social psychology of neoliberalism. Here I ask scholars from all of the social sciences to contribute their work about how a macro contextual ideology that is mainly discussed in the political sciences is intimately tied to everyday human psychology. The influence of neoliberalism has resulted in an asymmetrical cultural flow where wealthy nations, in particular America, hegemonize resources and cultural spaces of local cultures. Think about Facebook, Think about Google, think about Hollywood, think about McDonald's, and we can go on and on and on. This perpetuates social inequality on so many levels 
that we cannot even begin to describe the many ways in which it does. But I will highlight a few ways in light still regarding my example, the war on terror. So neoliberal consumerist culture revolves around economic growth and a profit motive as the drivers of the economy. In IR, this would be the era, for example, of a Marxist theorist. A Marxist theorist may ask how a context of global capitalism perpetuates global inequality, a, a divide, so to speak, between the haves and the haves not. Another direction can be found in post-colonial IR theory, wherein a scholar may say that colonial wealth gave the West a head start in a neoliberal globalized political economy that is rooted in the myth that the world is a level playing field and hence to keep the motor of the economy going of Western hegemonic states, there is a need for continuous resource extraction from countries in the global South. Countries that cannot compete due to the structural disadvantages rooted in a history of colonization. One way hegemonic states can do this is resource monopolization through occupation. The US war on terror, according to many post-colonial and other scholars, has a neoliberal profit motive. Not only is the US in dire need of oil to feed its economy, the military industrial complex needs continuous profits to keep its investors happy. Indeed, it has been ignored for far too long, but humanity in non-Western countries who suffer under such imperialism, such as Iraqis or Afghanistanis, undoubtedly have psychological reasons behind their frustrations as well. And one way of dealing with such frustrations of occupation and war is retaliation against a hegemonic powerful state through actions deemed as terrorism. So instead of merely looking at this from a macro perspective, dealing with security, economy, resources, again, I stress there is an inherent connection with human psychology. A theory in psychology would say that occupied people who are stripped from their humanity and resources will be in a state of chronic deprivation. Relative deprivation theory states that when people feel that they are deprived compared to others, they become angry and sometimes violent, depending on the severity of the situation. The same can be applied to the protests in the US right now, where discriminated groups are angry because of, of the police killings of black people. Similarly, relative deprivation may play a role in Hong Kong, in the Hong Kong protests, where one of the crucial factors may be the perception of the deprivation of democratic freedoms. Hence, all these international political events have their roots in some way, shape or form in social psychology and vice versa. But there is more to the global reign of neoliberalism. And that is what I mentioned before, an asymmetrical cultural flow, which I argue has tremendous influence on international relations and the world system. I will try and highlight how an asymmetrical cultural flow from the West, and America in particular, reproduces and reinforces global systemic inequalities. Inequalities that influence both the psychological and international level and thus are mutually constituted. I have an interesting thought experiment. Do you remember, does any of you remember the terrorist attack in France on Charlie Hebdo? Does anyone remember that? Maybe Professor Beatty, do you remember it? Yeah, yeah, the Je suis Charlie. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, do you, so that was a cartoon in a cartoon company where 12 people died. And do you remember that it was world news and how everyone was in shock? Mm -hmm. Pro Professor Beatty? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was, it was, I remember it as being uh, pretty big at the time and certainly on Facebook, you saw everyone change their, their profile to have the French flag in the background. Right. Well, good point actually, because maybe you're predicting my stuff, but um, I was actually going to ask, do you remember the French flags people would put on their Facebook profile, give their support to the French? During those days, I lived in Hong Kong. And I remember it vividly how many Hong Kongers would put French flags on their profile in mourning of the victims, okay? The 12, indeed, the 12 innocent victims in France. 
But then something interesting happened. Then a girl posted, a uh, girl's post on Facebook fascinated me and always stuck with me. A Mongolian student in Hong Kong put an Iraqi flag on her profile, which she had photoshopped because Facebook did not have options for non-Western flags at the time. And she said, I stand with the Iraqi victims. She was the only one I've ever seen with an Iraqi flag on her, on her profile on Facebook. Her post was an eye opener to me and she confronted me and us in general with a very harsh truth. How come that the war on terror unfairly waged by the West in Iraq, there were no weapons of mass destruction, there was no relation between Iraq and terrorist groups and 9-11, which had resulted in, according to some statistics, in one and a half million death Iraqis, did not move Hong Kongers or anyone around the world to even bet an eye, to even consider. While 12 deaths of French people in a retaliatory attack, the terrorists clearly stated that it was for all the deaths in the Middle East, moved the whole world. It reminded me of something. It reminded me of the linguist and political scientist Noam Chomsky's book, Who Rules the World? Where he states that Western imperialism has created a hierarchy of people. And he called that a hierarchy of people and unpeople. According to Chomsky, people, those who we classify as people, we deserve our empathy. They deserve our morality. But then we have a group of people that we classify as unpeople. They are outside the scope of our, our care. They are outside the scope of our morality. Here, international developments, against, again, touch on the intricate connection between IR, political science, and human psychology. Why do invasions of countries in the Middle East get silent support due to the silence of many people but why does the whole world, including the non-Western world, condemn attacks on Western and in particular white people? To stay in the realm of neoliberalism and the asymmetrical cultural flow it produced, we are every day confronted with highly Western-centric media, Google, Facebook, Hollywood, I said it before. Their wealth in a neoliberal political economy um, sorry, I have to get to the right slide. Yes, okay, their wealth, okay, the wealth of, of these companies in a neoliberal political arena result in them monopolizing their influence in local cultures. In a recent paper that I published in Perspectives on Psychological Science, I tie this asymmetric, asymmetric cultural flow to colonialism and colorism. Even though it is published in one of the most leading and mainstream psychology journals in the world, I used a very reflective cultural psychological approach that is usually more accepted in IR and sociology. I drew on post-colonial IR theory, among others, to argue that colonialist thinking is reproduced because our popular culture and media system is driven by Western and, dare I say, white narratives. Western societies have been able to impose their ideals of in-group human aesthetics, for example, fair-skinned in-group prototypes, onto peoples of the non-Western world, whose economic hardships deny them the affordance of a similar mobility. This effect should be seen in light of, again, the global reign of neoliberal capitalism, which celebrates a globalized, fair, and free marketplace. But in reality, however, it results in a form of cultural colonization, wherein wealthy nations use their economic hegemony to hold power over the cultures of less affluent nations. For example, Google has been accused of applying racist algorithms that promote white ways of being. Think about Eurocentric beauty ideals, whereas Facebook has recently been caught using political fact-checking companies with ties to white supremacist groups. Hence, these corporations hold disproportional influence over the psychology of global recipients of social media and thereby maintain 
Western hegemony in non-Western nations through the selective presentation of pro-Western and often racialized information. This, without a doubt, has tremendous psychological effects globally. This may also be the reason why Hong Kongers in 2015 felt so empathetic to the 12 victims in France without ever considering one and a half million victims in Iraq. This may also be the reason, beyond a cry for international help, so many Hong Kong protesters wave American and colonial era flags during the protests without realizing the horrors their ancestors endured during colonial rule. But also, this may explain the globalized hierarchy we see based on skin color. A socially constructed hierarchy rooted in colonial times that places European people at the top and the darkest African people at the bottom. Ask yourself the following question. And this is a thought experiment again. Ask yourself the following question. Why is it that African people get treated so much worse in Asian societies than Europeans? While Africans have never colonized any part of Asia. Ask yourself that question and try to wrestle with yourself. What is the conclusion in your mind as to what the reason is? Mainstream psychological theory, such as moral disengagement theory, would say that outgroup members, such as Africans or Iraqis, are outside the scope of our morality. Yet, it does not explain the contextual differences between moral judgments of different groups. If outgroups are deemed as lower on the moral standing, why does it not count for Europeans among Hong Kongers? Why are some groups more outgrouped than others? All questions that are deeply rooted in global developments in the world system. I am aware that these are very confronting, sensitive, and often even painful questions we need to ask, not only to ourselves, but also to our societies, and last but not least, as academics. The political sciences, and normative IR in particular, understood the inherent importance of values of justice in academic research. The English school in IR, with its multidisciplinary approach, understood the inherent value in normative research, instead of a neutral, positivist science that, uh, that assumes unfair contexts as natural, as a given, we as academics say, we, ex we as academics, they say, have an obligation to dig into our moral values and apply them to the world around us. Immediately come to mind our influential IR theorists, such as Robert Cox and Samir Amin, who already in the early 20th century saw the intricate connection between local inequality as situated within the international dynamics of imperialism. The social world, and as such, the social sciences, are a human endeavor and therefore cannot be fully devoid of any subjectivity. International relations and the global system is a fascinating area and university is a perfect place to study these asymmetries and injustices, both at the global as the psychological level. Indeed, universities have always been rooted in ethics of justice and equality of mankind. It has only been very recent, it's only very recently that they have gotten a veneer of objectivity that is disconnected from norms of justice and motivations for human dignity. Indeed, to satisfy these motivations, to understand what is going on, we need a contextualized IR approach to psychological phenomena and vice versa. Time constraints, unfortunately, do not allow me to go into much further detail. But I hope that my short seminar has given you an idea of the exciting and fruitful endeavor we have laying in front of us. To wrap it up, I'd like to present to you a metaphor. Try to look at IR and psychology as a scope observing the same thing. Zoomed out, the scope sees the bigger picture, of international development between structures such as states, or institutions, while zoomed in, 
it sees the individuals making up of these larger global structures. Then, when we zoom out again, we understand better how these global dynamics arise. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Dr. Batash, for the very enlightening talk. Um, I particularly liked how you tied uh, these, these theories in psychology about in-group bias, out-group bias, that are kind of colorblind in themselves, but then applying them into an IR context where they, where they acquire more uh, direct relevance and then they become not colorblind. Right. And I think overall, the, the case you made tying psychology and IR together is, is very convincing. Uh, kind of reminded me, I have a, a couple of questions I wrote down. Um, I'll just start by asking one and then open it up to all of your questions. Um, it reminded me, your talk reminded me of, um, there was a behavioral economist, I forget his name, but he basically said that if you have an economic theory without an explicit psychological theory, what you really have is an economic theory with an implicit psychological theory, and it's probably a pretty bad psychological theory. Um, and so that made me think of uh, uh, realism and in particular the uh, assumption of, of states as rational self-interested actors within realism. And I would assume that you would challenge this notion, but I wanted to ask you how you would, how you would do it. And I would just bring up maybe the, the, the best case scenario for that theory and then the, maybe a worst case scenario. You know, the, the, the uh, example that I hear brought up to defend that assumption is uh, the Sino-Soviet split, uh, the, the split between China and the USSR. If ideology were really driving states to do what they do, then you would have thought that, you know, these two states would be in a very close alliance. Uh, that didn't happen. And realists say, well, that's because our theory is correct. Forget about ideology. That's just window dressing. It's all about uh, immediate objective material interests, so on and so forth. Whereas the weakest case or, or a weak case is the, uh, the war on Iraq, the US war on Iraq, where you had realists uh, taking opposite positions like Mearsheimer saying this is a foolish thing from a realist perspective, but then plenty of other realist IR theory, theorists saying that this was an intelligent move. So how would you, uh, uh, how would you deal with that aspect of realism? What do you think about it? How, would you challenge it? What, what, what's your response? Yeah, well, first, what is the most important first, and, and somebody who, who, who would defend that position is also somebody uh, who has the burden of proof, and that is what is rational behavior? Okay, that is the first crucial question we can already ask. What is rational behavior? Because if you say certain kind of behavior is rational, you're already excluding context because it depends on, the, on space and time, what is rational. What is rational right now can be not rational five minutes from now. What is rational for one person can be not rational for another person. So if you already assume rationality, that states engage in rational action, in rational behavior and self-interest, then you already assume something based in human psychology. That means that in, in a, on a collective level, an aggregate of humans in a state, and this can be anything, elites, citizens, government, anyone act rationally on a state level to, to in, in, in their own self-interest. That already crumbles when you think about all the social identities that a state is made out of. Is it rational for average Americans to go to war? Or is it, average, is it rational for the elites to go to war? And if it's rational for elites to go to war, then why has it, has it always been rational with all the, all the failures of war? What is rational? That's the first premise. And if you have a premise and you say this is rational behavior, okay, then you need to prove psychologically if that is the case, that people are, are, are engaging in what you say is rational behavior, even though I think it doesn't exist because rationality is subjective. We're living in a subjective world. So I would say it's better to try and explain where something comes from based, situated in that space and that time. So why did America uh, attack uh, um, 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 uh, Iraq. Why did they do that in that moment in time with those people? In that? So you, there are so, mo so many levels to, to, to check this psychologically, many different identities that in my opinion, it's, it's, it's terribly slippery slope to, to, say, to, to, to say almost the neoliberal subjectivity of rational behavior. Because in the end, we human beings, in my opinion, are not rational actors. 
Well, let me uh, open it up to, to questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, feel free if you'd like to send in a question via the, the group chat. Uh, I'll be monitoring that and I'll, I'll invite uh, Dr. Patash to answer any questions that come in via chat. Or uh, feel free to just turn on your, your video and audio and ask any questions you might have uh, that way. I'm expecting a difficult question from Professor Jew. <laughs> May I ask a question? Of course. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm Jennifer Allison from Geography. I think to some extent, geography and uh, psychology similarity, we touch upon many things, huh? uh, yeah. natural process, uh, so cultural, social aspects. But we also have something political geography dealing with the international aspects as well. But myself is not working in this area. But anyway, I have uh, a question because uh, as we know, in terms of international relations, America is so important to all the power of the center of the global. So if anything, international level, America is very important in, in, in the ways of uh, solving many issues, okay? But so my, my, my question is about how we can uh, evaluate Americans' international, we say actions, such as we say very recently, okay? America and WHO, because they are fighting, and America with the Chinese company Huawei, do you have comments on these two uh, examples of this relation? The American is, is driving this uh, process? Yeah, uh, I, I guess you, there, there are multi, multi, multiple ways to actually approach this, this kind of um, uh, relations. And, 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 and the interesting, I, I, the interesting um, thing is that is, it, the, the, the relationship between China and the United States uh, and what you're saying with the whole Huawei case um, you can you can you can see it from so many levels. You know you can see it indeed from a state that tries to protect its hegemony, also in the in the, in the economic sphere, but also and you see that now, for example, and this this must play a role in my opinion. Also, how how people's subjective psychology deal with the fact that a non-Western country is actually rising in hegemony, a non-white non-Western country is rising. So if you have, for example, uh, 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 Germany as a very powerful state, indeed, it, America will still try to, to, to maintain its interest in its hegemony. But the fascinating thing with the whole China issue is that we are now, for since a long time in history, getting a very powerful non-Western state. So you get not only eh, what you say, what you maybe study in geography, the, the, the group level issues, but also this may be, even be strengthened or attenuated, so to speak, by people's psychological attitudes and psychological feelings towards China, towards the Chinese system, towards Chinese people. So again, there, there are so many ways to, to, uh, to, to focus on, on these issues. Yeah. And we have a question from Professor Sean Wong. Can uh, you just unmute yourself? Or here, let me see, I can, ah, okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, th thanks for the uh, very interesting uh, talk. Um, I have a, I guess, comment disguised as a question, um, less about the uh, uh, the content of the representation than about this your views on the sociology. I guess I guess that might be the proper proper word: sociology of, of academia or are the disciplines, the two disciplines we're concerning here, which is psychology um, and also political science, or IR. Um, you obviously come from a, uh, from, from the background, given your training uh, from, uh, uh, in psychology. And uh, uh, I, on the other hand, come from the background of, of, of IR, international relations, particularly international relations theory. So what your, your presentation here differ, uh, points to something, a very interesting phenomenon that I'm seeing in these two disciplines, in these two um, universes. Um, on the one hand, you're basically saying that there are all these very nice psychological explanations for phenomena that are, I wouldn't say, uh, at the risk of a slight caricature, I guess, on 
So you have these psychological explanations for phenomena that are historically of interest to IR scholars. Um, therefore, you, you, uh, you could use psychology to explain all these world phenomena like racism or war, uh, inequalities and all that. At the same time, coming from the point of view of IR, there has been a, a I would say rather, uh, it's rather um, important movement in the past 10 or 15 or 20 years on what has been called the psychological turn in IR or the micro turn in IR. Basically, if you marry the two concepts, basically looking at the psychological aspects or psychological variables at the individual level, um, the hence micro to explain uh, all these international political phenomena and to point out the fact that a lot of the IR theories we study, like you mentioned earlier, realism, neoliberalism, constructivism, have a, have have a lot of psychological assumptions that are untested and unproven. Um, so there's a turn towards looking at psychology for insights to further strengthen uh, the so-called micro underpinnings of the IR theories that we've been studying, right? So it's interesting in the sense that um, the the, uh, the articles you, you you showed us that you wrote in and the literature you published in uh, are based in say psychology, psychology journals. But at the same time in IR journals, you are also seeing people, uh, I could mention a couple of names, using these psychological approaches to understand IR. So it seems like it's interesting and in, in a way deplorable, I don't know if that's the right word, to see that there are two obviously, all these uh, disciplinary distinctions are in a way man-made, right? We are all, this is, we live in one social world, but somehow the sociology of the academia has, we have we, uh, have us uh, divided into psychology versus uh, political science or IR. So, my, so therefore, it's very interesting as, as if we are op we are op operating in parallel universes. So, IR yeah. scholars they claim to be studying a psychology or using concepts from psychology, but they don't really publish in psychology journals all that often. There are exceptions, and same thing vice versa for psychologists working on issues uh, historically of concern to IR or political scientists like war, terrorism. Um, uh, racism and all that. So my guess question, again, is less about the content than the, than the sociology of the academia. What's, the, what's, your, what's your suggestion in terms of trying to, um, I guess, bridge the divide or the fact that you can, it's kind of pointless to pour in two separate streams of resources onto more or less, you know, studying more or less same, same sets of questions. It's just that it so happened that we all, a group set A of people go to the International Studies Study, Study Association conferences, and group B of people go to the uh, uh, to, to psychological uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. associations, right? So, how what's the what's the what's the what's the what's your what's your advice on how to bridge the gap between these two disciplines? Yeah. Uh, I pretty much agree with every everything you say. Uh, it's almost like like it, it's my own answer, so that's that's very nice. Uh, I, I I totally agree with you. Um, I, I have just recently actually started applying for uh, for. Um, can you still hear me? Because I see something. Okay, yeah, okay. okay. I've recently um, actually started applying for and also been accepted by political science conferences with my own work to actually try and actively bridge that gap. Because, like you said, and I totally agree with this, is that the social sciences have actually become identities in and of themselves. I mean, the only reason why I call it psychology and you call it maybe uh, IR, the only reason should be what you are studying, not how you are studying or which theories you are using. So I think we should just all be part of that academic community that works together and tries to understand these phenomena. But slowly we have turned into like, these, the, our interests have turned into an, to an identity. And when it's, there's an identity, psychological research, this is psychological theory. What happens when we have an identity? We start to compete and we start to compare. We start to try to distinguish ourselves from other groups. So there's, a, I, 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 I wholeheartedly, I wholeheartedly agree that we should be uh, working in the same departments, working together also on the same topics. One option is uh, indeed, like you said, what happens in IR, the psychological turn, I've actually, uh, I've actually read uh, some, some stuff on that as well. Um, and, and, and I must say IR and, and political science in general is, is, is in that sense more 
um, how can you say the groundbreaking uh, than, than, for example, psychology, because you or your, 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 your science, so to speak, already had that fierce debate between positivism and, and a more reflective approach. While in psychology, even though it's now growing and I'm one of the contributors, it is still very, very positivist and, and very, very rooted in an American style of research. So, but I'm seeing the turn and I'm seeing the changes. Like you say, I also see IR departments around the world incorporating psychologists. Like I said, when I was invited to the London School of Economics, one of the professors immediately asked me why I'm not part of IR. So you see already that it's, it's, it makes sense to people. It's just that, that yeah, you, you need some leading, leading groups, departments, conferences that, that really actively engage the different fields with each other. And that means also geography, anthropology, sociology. There's so much to learn. So, uh, yeah, totally agree with you, uh, what you said. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, feel free to just you know turn on your video feed and your audio feed, or you can also just type in your question to the chat group. Okay, if, if uh, nobody has a question just now, I'll take the opportunity to ask my second question here. Um, so I was. I was interested, you mentioned uh, uh, colonialism as a phenomenon that's still relevant uh, today. Uh, I think a lot of people would, would look at that, that uh, statement and say, wait, you know, colonialism is over. Uh, uh, the colonies, all the colonial empires were dismantled. We're now in a, a post-colonial era. Uh, so can you expand on, on why you think that uh, colonialism is still relevant to an understanding of the global system today? And how is it obvious additionally at the individual level? So how is colonialism still relevant on a global macro level and on an individual level today? Um, yeah, this, this is, a, of course, all, the, all these questions uh, are, are very complex questions and I, I couldn't ask them uh, one, two, three like that. But what I can say is that there are many, many ways to see the insidious influence of colonialism. One, and if you're asking me about the global stage, Let's divide societies in those who colonized the world or in general colonized the world more than the societies who were mainly colonized. And now ask yourself, how is the division of wealth right now between countries? I think that is one of the evidence we have that colonialism still is structurally embedded in our global society. Um, and on an individual level, well, let me even ask you a very simple question. I mean, I, I know that you have also done some work in, 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 in psychology. Let me ask you this question. Why do we always, or pretty much the majority of times when we do psychological research, ask for race? Why are we asking almost as if it is normal, a category based on race? Even though we know that races don't exist, we know that human beings very, very gradually change in appearance, not even personality, but in appearance, something that you can see once you go from point A to point B. But there are no racial demarcations. Yet we still perpetuate a system that has been imposed 500 years ago, 400 years ago, four or 500 years ago, that divided human beings in racial groups purely on an arbitrary characteristic of the amount of melanin in your skin and the shape of your eyes and your nose and your facial features. That is very strange because we can do that to any kind of category. Psychology shows that once you categorize people, you get intergroup competition. competition. We call it minimal group paradigm. You categorize people. I can assure you if you have a baby growing up in a world where you do not categorize based on race or any other eh, color, skin color characteristics, but you categorize based on no shape or freckles or eye color, you will get the same kind of dynamics as when you categorize on any other feature. So to make a long story short, in so many ways, you can still see colonialism. Let me give you one more structural example. When I'm in Asia, and in particular Southeast Asia, something struck me. 
And that is that the lower the jobs I see, for example, in Malaysia, the lower the jobs, the darker the skin color. Does it mean that these people are unintelligent? Does it mean that they are lazy and they don't study? And that's why they have low job? Or could there be a structural reason of historical wealth accumulation within their own category that made certain groups disadvantaged and certain groups advantaged, which is being reproduced in a neoliberal capitalist system that maintains human categories and their relative status in hierarchies. These are questions that we need to ask. These are questions that are very sensitive for me as a European, for you as an American, other people as Chinese, these are very sensitive questions and I, 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 I totally get that. But we need to ask them because it, in, if, if we keep testing on the individual level, we are, we are literally contributing to maintaining the status quo, to not questioning the context within, these var within which these varial, variables are sit situated. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I had a question. Please go ahead. Hey, Kareem. How you hey, doing? You. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? Uh, I'm an old friend. This is, I'm an old friend of Kareem for anybody out there. I'm not really an academic per se, but uh, uh, what I kind of wanted to uh, focus on, though, is uh, I, I, I really enjoyed the talk, by the way, first of all, and uh, it really gave me a lot to think about. Now, what I'm really, really interested in is uh, you propose, you kind of painted this sketch, a picture of a post-colonial world, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so what I kind of want to do is you to kind of freestyle on how we get there, you know, what the remedy is, because that to me is, the, is, is where the rubber meets the road, you know, so could you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, I wish I had the answer. I think uh, we, we, would have, <laughs> we would have a great world by now. Um, yeah. What would be I mean, this might be something we need to do over, over beers or something, but, you know, <laughs> you can give it a shot. <laughs> oh, so so what, what, what would be, there are many, many possible solutions. One is, sure. okay, where are these, where are these in, uh, inequalities rooted in? And yeah. I personally think that it's, main, it's, it's, it's most deeply rooted in this, the capitalist system that we are living in. A capitalist system based on profit almost automatically creates social inequalities based on any category. It doesn't even need to be race. It can be anything. People in lower social class, whatever. There, there needs to be a group of extractors, resource extractors, and there needs to be a group of people who are suffering under this, this system. Okay, this, is, this system is not created for equality. So what do you need to do? To be honest, I have no idea. I'm not, I'm not Karl Marx who, who really knew the answer. Even Karl Marx would admit that it's probably very hard to do and maybe not even the complete answer. But one of the, one of the solutions would be to democratize, to democratize indeed labor. That's what Marx would say. Okay, so ownership of labor, democratizing ownership of labor. That could be a solution. Um, to me, I, I, I'm a bit pessimistic as long as we're in a system where, where, you have, where, 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 where it's almost logical to pursue your own, to your own profit, so to speak, to, to get by in life. And, the, and, 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 and it, when you do particular, when you go into particular avenues, mm you get more money and the more money you have, the more power you have also to oppress other people who don't have the money, whether it's in labor, whether it's in, in, in land ownership. So to get to a solution, I don't know, but I think at the core is, is, is the capitalist system that we are living in. Okay. Uh, so if, okay. So you, so you're saying that the, 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 the found, the foundation of said oppression, is largely rooted in the existence of capitalism in its current form. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Okay, I see. So so if if okay so if that's the case, right? Um, why is it that uh, capitalism hasn't been? How, how come a better way 
something, how come a better way has not produced a hegemon as great as the hege hegemons produced under a capitalist system? I mean, so, if that's inherently true, then you would have, capitalism would have been usurped a long time ago, but it continues to right. propagate. But then so how, well, how is that? How is that? How's that happen? That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting and, and very philosophical question because yeah. we call it a hegemon as great as we had before. Why would you call it great? Well, okay, okay, okay. Not as, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not putting any value on it. I'm saying as robust. So we've had a robust capitalist hegemon, hegemony, yeah. hegemony, um, yeah. and, 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 and we're still saddled with that. So right. why, is, why, has, why has capitalism persisted in, in light of, of all of this? You see what I'm yeah. saying? I mean, that, again, and, I, and, and, and don't get, don't get, don't get, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just trying to figure out yeah. where this robustness lies and, and, and how we, how do we get to, uh, you know, humanity 3.0 or whatever, as opposed to where we're at now. So that is the, that is the, that is, that is, again, it actually affirms what, what, what I was just saying, like capitalism okay. is as a, almost such an amazing, it's such an amazing self-cleansing system. It's the moment it gets threatened. You know, you see it, for example, uh, right. you see it with, with countries that, that, that try to rise in the global sphere, let's say the Middle East. Uh -huh. You know, the capitalist centration of wealth makes sure that that does not happen, okay? So you, have, you already have a system that is, that is just so embedded into the world that we are now that actually anti-capitalist thinking is, is such a complex philosophical endeavor that I'm not going to be able to... Uh, to answer you right now uh, during this seminar. Okay, uh, and one, one, other, one other thing to follow on, just, just, I just wanna, something that just came to mind. Um, after, in the sort of post-colonial world, and I don't, I mean, do you, first of all, do you agree that we're in a post-colonial world or are we still in a colonial world? Uh, I think we're still in a, in a in, well, we call it post-colonial. Uh, we call it post-colonial. Yeah, okay. we call it post-colonial, but of course, there are so many dynamics that, that are comparable to colonialism. Correct. So now I look at, I look at uh, what's going on in Africa, right? Right. Um, and at the end of, at, at the conclusion of formal colonization uh, on the behalf of, uh, you know, the European powers at the time, Right, you know, yeah. there were they they were the major colonists in the in in, in the sort of colonial heyday. Do you agree with that statement? You know, like the Dutch. Okay, so the Dutch and the French and 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 you know the uh, the the British were the, the 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 big colonial powers during sort of colonial heyday in the in the search for sugar and and tea and coffee and all this kind of stuff. Right. Right. Is that is that so? You agree with that assessment, right? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so, so that happened. And then what you saw in the 60s was a, was a huge push throughout all of those former colonies in Africa for uh, a, a huge push for socialism, huge push for, albeit socialism, communism. I, I don't, I'm not, you know, let's, let's not get caught up in, in exactly what it was, but we were looking more towards a Marxist type of society as a reaction to Colonialism is that that you agree with that statement? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, and and so what I'm what I'm wondering is if you know why is it that none of those uh, socialist slash communist systems uh, created the type of wealth and the prosperity and the type of um, uh, 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 technology and things that, that you see coming out of a the the, the more uh, capitalist oriented system? Do, do you have any? Right. You know, okay. So. So then, then we have to define what is wealth. I mean, let's yeah, say okay. let's take the United States as an ex example. Correct. Who's wealthy? Is it a small elite or is it the general population? Um, I think I would argue that that the average lower middle class person in the United States is wealthier than ninety is in the one percent. Yeah, that's what I would argue. And we're already talking about countries that were structurally disadvantaged due to colonialism. That that's true. Try to implement socialism. Let's take South America, for example. Correct. Every country that tried, and I'm thinking about Guatemala, Honduras, every country that tried to introduce something right. where, where resources would be more fairly distributed among mm -hmm. 
the population, you would almost definitely get interference from a hegemon like the United States mm -hmm. and to avoid any, any like in statement of so-called socialist government. And the socialist governments that did get instated in some countries also, for example, let's, let's, take, let's take communist countries where people say, oh, they're communist, but, but it's, it's also totalitarian. Mm -hmm. We're talking about theoretical communism or we're talking about literally people who call themselves communists, but in the same time just are, 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 are similar to, to any kind of uh, elite that holds, holds all powers. You know we're what talking I mean? uh, yeah I'm talking about people who said hey we are this is this is you know like uh, for example Venezuela you know they said hey we you know under Chavez they said we are a socialist country um, and and even up until like 20 10 15 years ago they were lauded as the socialist miracle a proof that the socialism works and you know even I myself I was looking at like oh wow this is this is interesting this is an interesting development and now uh, we see them in the state that they are. So does that mean that socialism didn't work? Or does that mean that, you see what I'm saying? How come they yeah, weren't? No, no, I, I totally understand what you're saying, but I guess that yeah. that's, a, that's a good discussion someday to, uh, to yeah, have right, more right, time right. for. Yeah. Absolutely. Over beers, for sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Th thanks, man. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Uh, we've got one from the... Uh, chat room. Sean, do you have a, another question? Yeah, uh, I guess only if no one else has uh, any for now. Um, I, have an, I have a second question in my mind earlier, uh, which is um, the, so uh, coming from IR theory, I'm very conscious about this, like the levels of analysis problem. I guess coming from all social sciences, that would be an issue uh, foremost in, 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 in a person's mind. Uh, you're, you're talking about the individual level and you're basically proposing individual individual psychological explanations for these larger for world system you're connecting the individual level with the world system with the world level world systemic level uh, where do, where do you see uh, what I guess in IRC in IR lingo would be the second image or the third image like a second image come uh, uh, figure so uh, national experiences uh, so different different countries have different cultures, different his, different historical backgrounds that would color or or uh, uh, their their views on racism, on inequality, that different philosophies, different uh, uh, again traditions and cultures, even the use of language from a linguistic point of view could make individuals perceive the world differently. So I guess to to boil down one question. You, uh, to boil that in a, in a simple sentence, uh, you, I appreciate the, um, the effort to try to bridge the individual with the world, world systems, but by doing so, would it, it, to what extent would it be bypassing the very different, unique uh, individual, like, uh, sorry, national experiences uh, that different countries have? Uh, right. Because of, again, oh. of their cultural, historical, philosophical backgrounds. Yeah, no, good point. And, and that is actually the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that it's mutually constant. Uh -huh. It's not only from the individual level to the group level. It's also not only uh -huh. from the group level to the individual level. It's a very complex, mutually constituted relationship, back and forth, back and forth. So to give you an example, um, in, 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 in the Philippines, you have, uh, you, have a, you have some very famous psychologists called uh, uh, David and Okazaki, who created something called a colonial mentality scale. That, we, that Filipino, Philippine people who still have a more colonial mentality, feeling inferior to Europeans, for example, uh, treating people with darker skin uh, less, less good. And the interesting thing is that they show that this can be, this, this, this can be primed. So in <clears> other <throat> words, if you have certain cultural cues that remind you of mm -hmm. colonial times, let's say even a European building, this triggers people's, may trigger people's colonial mind. We call it cognitive priming in psychology, which actually colors your behavior. Now, now uh -huh. think of this. Think of this coloring your behavior on a large scale nationwide level. What happens to all these people? You get actually an aggregate of, of almost a colonial mindset, which in turn shapes how all these people see global de developments, for example, of the Philippines, in light of United States imperialism or the way European tourists come there versus tourists from any other place of the world. 
So uh, your question is a very good one. And that is that, that is the that is why it's so crucial to combine all these, these, these fields is because the relationship goes back and forth, back and forth. And the only thing we can do as scientists is A, if we want to do that empirically, we can zoom in on one of these, these, these issues, say colonial mindset, but also as social scientists and more reflective approaches like in, in IR, for example, is try to tie that to these larger social developments. So we can at least get an explanation for these things uh, a bit back and forth, so to speak. But in the end, yeah, it's a very complex. There will always be variables that we can relate to these issues. Yeah. Okay. And we have a question from uh, Professor Calvin Chung. Yes, um, thank you, Peter. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for your presentations. I'm just trying to uh, refer back to uh, one of the theories that you've mentioned in your presentation. You talk about the relative deprivation theory. You said that like people act out of a sense of deprivation to take up you know, certain kind of sometimes uh, a bit violent, a bit aggressive behavior. Um, I just wonder, do you have any more insights on how did they establish that they are relatively deprived? I mean, um, what would you think on the role of things like social institutions or discourses, which is what I'm, you know, researching on, right. uh, articulating this kind of a sense of deprivation? That's a very good point. Um, well, psychological studies have, for example, shown that if you give people feedback about their about their position, for example, you have, um, uh, let let's say. Um, that you, you give an ob objective numerical outcome, okay, to a group of people, okay, they have to, they have to give their data, let's say, uh, the education level, their, 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 their job, everything, and they just get a numerical number. Okay, this is on average, uh, we would say, how much, uh, how much you, uh, you earn. And um, if you would then, another group, do the same thing, but say, also give them a number, number, okay, this is your, your, your standing, but not a relative standard, just a number. It's a, it's a bit hard to explain. But you say your number is 91% lower, uh, lower than 91% of other people. You will get way more anger among people. Now let's tie that to the global political context. Let's think about people living in the Middle East in poverty. Okay. And how long people have been living in huge poverty without even revolting. Then came Facebook, then came internet, and people were fed continuously with images from people in the West, Paris Hilton, Hollywood, beauty, everything. And suddenly you saw revolt after revolt after revolt after revolt in the Middle East. Now people will say, oh, we call it the Facebook revolt, the Arab Spring, we call it the Facebook revolt. Or people are really fed up right now but actually it has not been worse than before. It's just that people are starting to be aware relatively to other people that the way they are treated is, is, is not okay. So, you, you, so in that sense, relative deprivation triggers people to be more angry than when they would just be confronted with the objective statistics, so to speak. Yeah. Any uh, other questions? If you have one, please feel free to, to jump in. Well, since we have just uh, 15 minutes left, I thought I, I don't want to ask a, a third question, but if, if nobody else has one, there's just one thing I wanted to hear your, your response to. Um, you, you mentioned uh, a, a one-way cultural flow from the West to the rest, basically. Um, and then uh, uh, Chris had mentioned, you know, solutions, like what sort of solutions are there? And it made me think of the, uh, the new information world order that uh, the non-aligned movement and some of the second world nations were proposing in the 70s. Um, they basically were saying, look, uh, if you want to get news anywhere in the world, some 80% of your most available sources will be you know, from US media companies, from uh, France, from England, et cetera. 
yeah. and they were calling for the, the building of uh, media institutions in the third world, in uh, the second world as well, and, and to try to, to even the flows so that people in the West would be getting news uh, from you know, the global South, for instance. So do you think that that sort of thing is a kind of uh, a solution to the problems that you were talking about? Um, depends, Peter. Depends on who runs these who runs these these institutions. That's number one. I mean, we have other other global institutions being run with veto power by by the big powers, so they're pretty much useless in that sense. So you could also ask yourself the question: Okay, um, you can do that, but if there is still <clears throat> pardon, if there is still a profit motive behind these news companies, behind these media companies, then it's still becoming very tough. Because even though you want to spread it even across these societies, there's a profit motive. In the end, you will still see that the news, that the work, that what people see will be biased towards the wealth. So in, in my, my, my honest opinion, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 if, you, if you take out the profit motive and, and no veto power of, of superpowers, maybe there is a chance. Um, yeah, what do you what do you think yourself? I'm I'm curious. Yeah, I think uh, looking at the the media system itself and how it's structured is a is a key part of that. Because um, you can see uh, media systems in 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 global South countries where they have the the same structural flaw where you know it's a commercialized system. You need to uh, make money through advertising. Uh, only if your audience has money are advertisers interested in in paying you anything. If you're just broadcasting to a bunch of people without much disposable income, then, you know, that's not going to be incentivized. So, yeah, I would, I would agree that you'd have to look at the structure of the media system. But I, looking back on that, those new, new information world order proposals, it's, it's kind of funny because it's, it's like, you know, it's over 50 years old now. Right. But uh, it seems like it, it makes a lot of sense because the problem that they point out way back then is still very much uh, apparent today. And it, it goes exactly to what you were saying about one way flows of. Right. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's also compared like, like you had a lot of people who were predicting things. I mean, let's, let's not forget about George Orwell, how predicting he was about the way societies could, could develop. Um, and on the other hand, yeah. On the other hand, when you, when you take these things in consideration, you know, like, 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 uh, um, the, the influence we have from Google and Facebook, also in my country, the West, the Netherlands. I mean, it's just tremendous. We're all Americanizing. Uh, look at fashion, look at the way we talk about other groups. And, and the interesting thing is, in that sense, it, it makes sense that China was one of the very few countries in the world, the very few, maybe even the only one, maybe next to North Korea, that said, we're not going to let that Western propaganda inside our societies. Now, of course, we are all conditioned to think, yeah, wait a minute, um, that's, that's censorship and that's anti-democratic and that's anti-freedom. And I agree on many levels, I agree. But on the other hand, if you realize the tremendous soft power America has across the world due, due to its media system and all its servers being placed in the United States, they know everything about you and me. It makes sense that China made that decision. And let's be honest, it's the only country that is rising right now. So is there maybe a relationship? I don't know, you know, but, but yeah, these are, these are fascinating questions to think about. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, we have uh, 10 more minutes. So if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to, to jump in. So uh, I had a question. So, um, so I'm looking at, I, I come from a, a just a computer science, um, AI background. I'm not a social scientist in the least, but uh, I, I kind of look more at structural things. Um, so uh, you talked briefly about, well, well, kind of one of the overriding themes, obviously, is uh, this, so uh, uh, the, inter the international group context or effects versus uh, individual effects or context in, in, in that, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so um, I was wondering like what, um, 
do you guys uh, see uh, the current uh, incursions into uh, across the world with uh, uh, the Chinese? Do you see that as a as a net positive? I mean, or do you see that as a net negative? I mean, just give me your thoughts on that because you guys have a lot more insight than, than I do. So, uh, I, I find it a very hard question to answer because, like I said again, all these these endeavors of, of judging something as good or bad is a very subjective human human tendency. Correct. Correct. Um, but I think we, we 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 I think we are allowed as academics to 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 judge some things as moral or some things as immoral. Uh, well, I, and just because you do have, you know, you have a, a wealth of data that the average person doesn't have. So I, that's why I defer to you. You're, you're, yeah, that's I, why I respect, I respect your judgment on this. Thing, you know? uh, no, thank you very much. No, I, uh, I, I would say um, I, I find it a, a very hard question to answer, to be very honest, because I can see the good and the bad in, in pretty much any country around the world. Um, is it good that you have more of a balance of power across the world now with China rising? Yes. Is it good that that you, that that, uh, that that there is coming a system? That China seems to prefer a system that is very controlling of its, its citizens. In my opinion, no. But I'm just an, I'm just a, I'm just a human being. Uh, but is it good that the United States has imperialist tendencies around the world? No. Does America have some very interesting aspects on on fr uh, on freedom of expression? Yes. But it doesn't make one country good or bad. You just cannot predict that. You know, the only thing we can do is actually try to position all these developments in their specific uh, time and place and try to understand why they happened. Um, but, but, but any value judgment, I, I, find, I find, no, no, I cannot do that. Okay, so we're looking, so basically, I think we're in agreement that uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's a series of trade-offs and it's not, a, it's not a black and white thing. It's more of a, 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 I see, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, all right, thanks. Appreciate that. All right, uh, any other questions? All right, well then uh, with that, I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. Patash again for the, the great presentation and uh, thank all of you for tuning in and hope to see all of you uh, for the next one.